The reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 25, reading verses 1 to 13. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. <clears throat> but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will be not enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves at midnight. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you neither know neither the day nor the hour. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, there's someone among you who um, most Sundays meets me on the way out and says, um, I, I'm kind of, I'm always interested to see what you're going to do with the passage of scripture. Um, and uh, it was, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to see myself actually today, <laughs> where we're going, <laughs> where we're going. Look, it, it's, a, it's an odd parable, all right? What we've just read is, is, a teaching of, is a teaching. It comes to us in the book of Matthew. Um, it's an odd parable. It's full of cultural content that I don't think we will ever get. Culture and time have probably taken away a lot of the things that we might fully understand. It does not transpose well for us today to just read it literally and to only read it literally is doing yourself a disservice. To sound confident about something just because it's written down in English in a particular way will actually make yourself seem a bit foolish. I've got a whole bunch of questions that come out of this parable. Let me share a few with you. Par look, questions that I think help us to understand we need to be a bit gentle with the parable itself and not pretend we know everything about it or can ever put it all together properly. My first question is, what are the credentials to be, a, and what is the job of a first century Palestinian bridesmaid? We know it's got something to do with oil and lamps and a lot of hanging around. But how do you choose a bridesmaid? Is, does her father work in the oil industry? How patriarchal in this passage. It, like it comes to us, I've, I've given us the tidied up version because there's some, some um, and, and this is probably something we need to hold in line when we read the Christmas story because often the word is virgin. It's read as a virgin. So it's, a, it's ten virgins, that, so, so you're, which also means young woman. So if you think you've got the Christmas story all sorted out by calling Mary a virgin, you need to have a, double, have a think about it in the context of this passage. And then you've got to find three wise men, haven't you? Yeah, well, then you've got to find, when we get to Christmas time, it's hard to find three. Well, the, the point I want to make is if we were transposing this into our day and age, where would you find ten bridesmaids who are virgins? I've been, oh. Hey? Oh, gee, that was a, that was a, that didn't like that one, did you? But how patriarchal. The bridesmaids are selected based on their sexual relationship status. That's how you get picked as a, a bridesmaid. 
Now let me tell you very clearly this, that if I was the parent, and this is another reason why this parable sort of leaves me a little bit, oh, where's it going, what's it mean? If I was the parent of a young woman, of a young girl, in a culture where virginal status is meant to be upheld and protected, because it's really important when it comes to marriage, would you be happy, if you were her parent, would you be happy about her being out at midnight? Even if there were nine others with her, even if she was in company, would you be okay about her being out at past midnight? Would you be okay about her leaving her post to go and, go and try and find oil at, nine, at 12 o'clock at night? I wouldn't. I'd be having very, very stern words. Let me put it this way too. Let me ask you this question. What's the job of a bridesmaid? in first century, it's hard to understand. Because it seems to be that the bridesmaid's job is to tend to the groom. Wasn't there a case that the bridesmaids used to go to the groom's house and then accompany the groom to the bride? Well, that seems to be the job. That's right. So who's looking after the bride? If they're a bridesmaid, what's the job of a bride? See, this is what I'm trying to say. That, that, there's three wise men looking after the bride. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's enough from you, Ron. <laughs> Just to bring yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're doing well. Um, <laughs> but but can you see the can you see the, the fancifulness of some of, of some parts of this story? Even in its own time, being told there must have been some things where the risk, where the listener would have been going, wait up a second. So who looks after the bride? We still don't. I don't know. We don't have an answer for that. The best man looks after them. Well, I don't know you want to leave him, leave her in his company either. Not in their culture, like probably in their... That's why the story doesn't make... Um, and why is the bride not even mentioned in this story? It sounds like the... Well, actually, my, my daughter's got married about 10 days ago and one of the standing jokes was that we kept saying about... Her husband's name is Scott and we kept saying, thanks for being here at Scott's big day. You know, like it's the, the groom's big day. Because, you know, in our culture, it's the bride's big day. Everything about our weddings is centred around the bride. The grooms are kind of like, uh, you know, we're extras. Um, but, not in, but, but not in this story. In this story, the central character is the groom. The bridesmaids are there for the groom. And the groom in this story is still getting ready for his wedding at midnight. Can you tell me how many brides would put up with that? You know, I once conducted a wedding where the groom was, was late, was later than the bride. The bride had to do laps waiting for the groom because on their way to the, to the, to the service, the, the father of the groom, who was coming in the same vehicle as the groom, had left his heart medication back at home. So they had to go all the way back and come back and the bride had to do laps. I, I don't like this parable because the bridesmaids, five of them are called wise, but they're mean-spirited. They're stingy. They've got plenty of oil and they don't share. I don't get it. Because so many of our other teachings, in the, even from this same gospel, teach us about the compassion, about gratitude and about generosity. So why are we getting this parable? And what are we to make of it? And apart from that, let me ask another question. Who's selling oil at midnight? As Andrew pointed out, he was, as he was reading it. Who's selling oil? Pardon, sorry? 24-7, you reckon, was there. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> Who's selling oil at midnight? And how many bridesmaids, young women, are carrying enough money to buy oil? See, I've got a lot of... <laughs> If you missed that at home, Ron's now making a cultural reference to Midnight Oil, the band. <laughs> I'm impressed you know who they are, Ron. <laughs> so here's the thing. I don't think this parable is meant to be taken literally. It can't be. Not by us, anyway. It's certainly not designed as a Jesus around the barbecue telling a story about the last wedding he went to. 
where, where the facts are there and he's just rearranging them in a way to make comedy. The truth is, I think, that this parable is parody. It's taking a truth and extending it to make a point. It's become this kind of ledger. Like, like I was trying to think of a parallel for us. And I'm glad the kids aren't in the room because I'm about to destroy Santa Claus. Don't let them watch it online later. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, it's for you too. <laughs> but you know, you, know the, you know the legend we now have of Santa Claus? To the point that here we are in the Southern Hemisphere celebrating a man in a big red suit, all, cover, all, all gowned up, wearing, wearing winter clothes for the snow in the middle of Australian heat. The fake snow in the shops, the, the, the snowmen, all that kind of stuff. But, but we live with this legend and we kind of, it's a parody. And I think in many ways we've lost the point of Christmas. But there is a point there that Santa Claus is trying to help us to understand, I think, about the generosity and, and sharing around Christmas. But we've lost it. So what is the point? I'll stop, stop trying to be funny and I'll actually try and get to a point here. Um, and there's no surprises here, I don't think. You've probably heard this parable preached on a number of times. I'm just coming at it a bit from a different angle. So what is the point? I actually think what's going on in this parable and why we have it as we do is that it's a parable that's unique to the book of Matthew. You won't find it in Mark, you won't find it in Luke. Of the synop- you won't find it in John. Of all the Gospels, this one sits on its own. It's, it's only in Matthew. And I don't think it's Matthew just doing narrative, like trying to tell, uh, he's, not, he's not just doing gospel. Matthew isn't just trying to, to tell us another, this is another teaching of Jesus, I'm writing this down for you to know. I actually think Matthew is doing theology for his community of faith. The writer of Matthew is doing theology for his community of faith. In the same way that each week I stand up here and do theology for you, I help to try and understand the nature of God and how it fits in with our lives. That's what I'm trying to do. I may not be hitting the mark all the time, but that's what I'm trying to do for you and for me. Well, I think that's what's going on as Matthew writes this gospel down. He's not thinking about you and I 2,000 years later reading it. He's thinking about his community of faith. You see, the Matthew was written, the book of Matthew was written, now I know there's, con, there's conjecture around this, but at its earliest, Matthew was written in about 80 AD. The book of Mark was already written, and both um, Luke and Matthew, those books were written somewhere around 80 or later AD. And, um, and one chapter earlier in Matthew... So it's not that, well, we we put the chapters and verses in, Matthew didn't do this, but in his writing, not much earlier, he tells, recounts this point of Jesus. Again, as I keep trying to say, all these these readings that we're reading at the moment are all in the last week of his life, of Jesus' life. So he's in the temple grounds and he knows what's coming and he's making, he's either teaching really hard or he's making observations that, that are confronting and just a little bit earlier in the story, he tells this, he makes this observation. He says, look at all the grandeur, look at the temple. Look at how big and wonderful, how majestic it is. And he says, soon it's going to be destroyed. It will come tumbling down. It will be broken, shattered, smashed. And what he then goes on to say is that you will know that is a sign that I am returning. That's a bit problematic, isn't it? You'll know it's a sign that I'm returning. When you see the temple falling down, you'll know that's a a sign that I'm coming back. So here we are ten years later, Matthew's writing his gospel, and Jesus still hasn't returned. The temple's been pulled down. been destroyed and Jesus still hasn't returned. So Matthew is doing theology for his community. It's called eschatology. That's the kind of theology he's doing, end times theology. He's trying to help people understand how do we make sense of the second coming of Jesus 
when what Jesus said was going to happen hasn't. Because here we are 2,000 years later and this is where the relevance is for us. We're 2,000 years later and Jesus, as far as we know, still hasn't returned. So it's kind of relevant for us too. And one thing I've learned, even in my short lifetime, long lifetime, in my time on earth, is that you look like a fool when you, when you think you know when Jesus is returning. You name a date and you look like an idiot. And the other thing I've learned and this is a harder one because that one's easy to spot. It's easy to judge. It's easy to measure because the dates come and go and people are left making up excuses to why Jesus didn't return on the date they set. But the other one is I think that you look a little out of touch if you focus on it. So if we, when we focus on the second coming of Jesus, we start to look a little out of touch to the people around us. So what do we do with it? What does Matthew do with it? Let's go back to that question. What does Matthew do? Let me, I just want to say very clearly, I've said when you focus on it. I'm not saying that there is no second coming of Jesus. I'm not trying to say that I, I don't hold to some sense of, my, I hope for this, this time when the earth is, you know, when, when, when we are restored and renewed and when there's the new heaven and the new earth. I'm not saying I don't hold to that kind of stuff at all. I'm just trying to say I'm very careful with it and I don't focus on it. It's not my, it's not my central vision. Let God deal with that, is my view. So what does Matthew do with it? How does Matthew say to his community, you know, Jesus said that uh, the Messiah, he said, he said he's going to return and, uh, and he hasn't, 10 years later, 20 years later, if you believe in a later writing of Matthew, even if you believe in later than that, it's some period after and Jesus still hasn't returned. So what Matthew does, now again, I don't know how much basis of this is in the actual words of Jesus. But I don't doubt that Jesus told some sort of a story like this. But what Matthew does is he tells a parable. He highlights a parable about a dawdling groom. You know he's coming. He's got a wedding feast to be at. So you know he's coming. But when? How will we know when the groom is ready? What do we do while we wait? What do we do in the meantime? I think for me, if this parable teaches me anything, it's simply to be prepared. To be present in the moment, to know what I've got to be, who I've got to be and what I've got to be doing in the present moment. If I'm going to be a bridesmaid, I've got to turn up with an oil and with, I've got to turn up with a lamp and with oil. So in other words, be who you're meant to be in your true self called by God to live out your discipleship faithfully. Be who you are called to be. Meant, be who you're meant to be. Do what you're meant to do. Keep on with it. That's how you're prepared. Don't be distracted. Don't forget your call or your purpose. Be ready. As I said before, in the same way for the bridesmaids to know what the role of a bridesmaid is and what they have to do to be a good bridesmaid, prepare with that, not just that task, but that being. Like being a bridesmaid is more than just a role. If you're doing it well, you enter into the whole wedding process and you have a part to play in that. And who you are is important. You're not central, but you're significant. So 
So prepare with that in mind. Ready yourself for it. Get on with it. And know that the groom will come. So for us, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, I say this a bit more clearly, a bit more, no no metaphor, I'm saying this straight. For you and me, when we call ourselves disciples, if we say we're trying to follow Jesus, the one who brings life, know what your call, what your part in the good news is. Know what it is that you bring that's part of your contribution to God's work in the world. That's how you are ready. That's how you are prepared. Get on with it. We know that Jesus will come. So far, at 10.15, it's not today. But Jesus will come. I'd also want to add, in many ways, Jesus is present. And we sometimes lose sight of that. Jesus is present because you and I are here. But Jesus is coming. Jesus will come. How do we be ready? How do we be prepared? Hear the call of God that draws you into this space where your contribution is valuable. Your part in God's purposes, is invaluable. And get on with that. That's how you're ready. That's how we're prepared. Amen.